I love to bring to your attention those corny church signs that are out in front of some church buildings where they're always changing the sign to say something clever that will hopefully stop traffic and grab attention and, and attract people to their church. And most of the time they just try way too hard. Well, I've got some new church signs for you today. And some of them are just too clever for their own good, like this one. Sunscreen prevents sin burn. <laughs> Trying a little too hard. This was not bad. What happens in Vegas is forgiven here. <laughs> ah. Here's one I think they're trying to reach out to the hip-hop community at Christmas. Jesus is the rizzle for the sizzle. <laughs> and come here, Pastor Snoop Dogg, I guess. I don't know. And you're really... It depends on, with some signs, where you emphasize certain words and, and how you say it. Because this one is, we love hurting people. <laughs> what are they trying to say there? We love hurting people. Are they saying they love hurting people? Or they love hurting people? Or they love hurting people? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm not going there because I'm not going to risk it. So... After a few years, sometimes the sign will get old, letters will fall off, and it will change the whole church like this one, First Congregational Meth Church. <laughs> yeah, they have a huge recovery ministry. So. Now, a lot of the signs I notice are always the turn or burn signs. It's hellfire and brimstone because they think that's what's going to get some passing motorist to come to Jesus, come to the church. We're just going to tell them they're going to hell, and that's going to grab their attention and they're just going to come in and just thank you, thank you, thank you for telling me that. Now, this one, though, is pretty creative with it. It says, choose the bread of life or you are toast. <laughs> and this one's a little more direct. Read the Bible. It will scare the hell out of you. <laughs> I mean, I just like to get into the mind of the person who came up with that sign. It's like, I've got a great one. It's going to pack it out for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of times they'll put the title of the Sunday message up on the sign, but they forget that it'll be right next to something that's already up. Like this one here that says, do you know what hell is? Come hear our preacher. <laughs> I don't know. We experience that hell every week at our church. Come hear our preacher. Hopefully you don't feel that way. Today, we're going to talk about how do you find the miracle that you need most. And the key is signs. You look for the signs that God places in your path that point you to the miracle you need most. It's the same instructions the angels gave to the shepherds on that first Christmas. They said, look for the signs. In fact, look at Luke 2.12. It says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Underline that word sign. The shepherds followed the signs to the miracle of Christ. The wise men follow the signs to the miracle of Christmas. So what do you do when you need a miracle in your own life? You follow the signs that God puts in your path that point you to the miracle you need most. And some of you need a miracle this Christmas. Maybe it's a miracle in your finances or a miracle in your relationships, in your marriage, in your family, with your kids. Or maybe it's a miracle in your health but you need a miracle this Christmas. The good news is God's in the miracle working business. And he wants us to see those signs that he puts in our path that points us to the miracle. We're going to look at a miracle that God performed through the prophet Elisha. As this widow was in a desperate situation and she desperately needed a miracle. And God worked the miracle through Elisha. So I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. And would you stand in honor of God's word, Woodlands Church. And I want to welcome all of you guys at our satellite campuses and everyone worshiping with us through our broadcast ministry around the world. Wherever you are, you're welcome. And everyone here in the Woodlands, we're one church built on God's word. Just follow along with me. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, 
What do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Dear God, I thank you that you are here right now. And you want to work miracles in our lives. And you know what each person is going through. You know what each one of us need most. And Lord, every one of us in our lives are going through great things and experiencing great blessings in some areas of our lives. And in other areas of our lives, we're in the valley and we need miracles. So I pray that you would just help us see these signs and seize the moment and experience your miracle. And I pray in the next few moments, in the next few days, that you would just meet us where we are, but don't leave us there. Bring us to where we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. In this story, we see that this widow desperately needed a miracle, and she followed the four signs that led her to a miracle, the same four signs that lead us to the miracle we need most. The first sign is the one-way sign. You got to take the one way that starts a miracle. If you want a miracle, there's only one way to get started. You got to follow that one way sign, and the one way is admit my need. That's the starting point. If I want God to work in my life, I've got to admit that I need His help. I've got to say, God, I need you. I need your miracle in my life. The first principle of this whole story is God doesn't work in your life until you admit that you need His help. This woman admitted how desperately she needed a miracle from God. She had gone through a terrible tragedy. She had lost her husband. She was in a a terrible financial situation. And now the creditor was coming to take away her most precious possession in the world, her children. So she humbly admitted that she needed a miracle. She had no pride left. She just admitted that she needed a miracle from God. But we don't like to admit our problems. We like to hide our problems or pretend that they're not so bad. But in every one of our lives, we have problems and we need God. I used to think that life was like going through hills and valleys. That sometimes you're on the mountaintop and everything's good. And other times you're in the valley. It's kind of like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're on a plateau. Uh, Sometimes you're at the mountaintop. Sometimes you're at the depths of despair. But that's not really the way life is. Life is really two tracks. And on one track, you always have blessings and good things that are happening. But at the same time, you have another track where there's difficulties and problems and pain. And sometimes you can have a great thing happen in your business. And then you can have a very painful thing happen in your family. Or you can go through difficulties in one area of your life where you just can't see a way out. In another area, you're going through a time of blessing. That's the way life is. There are two tracks, always good, always bad, happening at the same time. And so there are always areas of our lives where we need a miracle from God. This woman received a miracle because she humbly admitted that she needed one. She needed this miracle. Look at 2 Kings 4 too, because she comes to Elisha and she tells him her desperate story, and he says this to her. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? That seems like a rude response at first. It sounds like that Elisha is just frustrated that this woman is bothering him. How can I help you? But no, I believe that he was pointing her to the one who could help her. He was making sure that she didn't put her trust in him, a human being. He was saying, I can't help you, but God can. The one way that starts a miracle is I admit my need, but then secondly, I bring my need to God. There's only one miracle worker. I bring my need to God. You don't need to go to the horoscope. You don't need to go to a faith healer on television. You don't need to go to a new age guru. You go directly to God. 
through his son, Jesus Christ. He is the miracle worker. He's the great healer. Now, God uses doctors and medicine. God uses good people. God uses pastors and prayer warriors. God uses a lot of people, but he is the healer. And he is the source of miracles. And you can go directly to him. Now, there's another sign, the stop sign that I have to see. I have to stop and assess what I already have. Elisha asked her another really strange question in 2 Kings 4, 2. He says, tell me, what do you have in your house? And God always asks us this question before he works a miracle in our lives. He always asks us to start with what we have. God always starts with what I have to give me what I need. And many times we say, God, I don't really have anything. That's why I'm coming to you for a miracle. I need you. I need you to give me what I need. And God says, well, what do I have to work with? God always starts with what I have to give me what I need. And like the needy widow, we get so caught up in what we don't have that we don't see the possibilities in what we do have. The beginning of the miracle was right under her nose. She just didn't see it because it seemed so small and insignificant. And the beginning of your miracle is right under your nose. You just don't recognize it because it seems so small and insignificant. But God always asked us that question, what do you have in your house? What do you have that I can work with? Well, God, I'm coming to you for a miracle. I need something. And God says, yeah, but what do you have? God always asks us that question. In fact, when Jesus performed his most famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, he asked the disciples a very similar question. Look at it with me in Mark 6, 38. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Go out and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. So why did Jesus ask them to go throughout the crowd and find out what they had? Because he's God. He could have snapped his fingers and called down bread from heaven. He could have just provided it from nothing as he created the world from nothing. But he said, find out what you have. They didn't have much. They said, a little boy has five loaves and two fish. And he said, great. Now I know what I have to work with. The principle is this. God loves to work miracles by starting with what I have. And when I don't have a lot, if I surrender it all to him, then he can multiply it. Then he can work the miracle and he gets all the credit. You take the little you have, you surrender it all to him, and he works the miracle. You take the little bit of time you have, you surrender all your time to him, and he can multiply it. You take the little bit of resources you have, you surrender it all to him, and then he can multiply it. You take the little bit of talent you have, and you surrender it all to him, and then he can multiply it. God always starts with what we have. He always asks, what do you have in your house? But many times we don't see what we have in our house because it seems so small and insignificant. And you won't see it and you'll miss the miracle unless you see this third sign, the U-turn sign. You make a U-turn from the negative to the positive. Because our first reaction when we have a problem in our lives is to say, I've got to focus on me. I don't have time to focus on someone else. I've got a huge problem in my own life. I don't have time to meet anyone else's needs. I, I've got to look at my need because I'm overwhelmed right now. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have any time in my schedule. My schedule's overwhelmed. I don't have time to help someone else, to lighten their load, and to help them with their burden. I, I've got one that's crushing me right now. And we miss out on the miracle. We go negative and we gripe and we complain. We say, nothing's good. It's all bad. And that's what this woman did at first. She said, I have nothing there at all. But then she takes a U-turn from the negative to the positive. Look at 1 Kings 4.2. It says, your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Hey, I give her credit. She takes this U-turn from the negative to the positive. It would have been real easy for her to say, I have nothing there at all, period, end of story. And she would have missed the miracle. And, but she takes a U-turn to the positive. She says, well, there is something really small and insignificant. Maybe there is a small possibility. Got a little bit of oil. And all through Scripture, oil represented the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christ follower, you got the Holy Spirit of God, that little bit of oil in your life, the same God who created the universe with the power of one word, the same God that put the stars in place, the same God 
who raised himself from the dead is alive in you. One plus God equals a majority. I don't care how many are coming against you, how many problems are coming against you, how great the vast army of problems are that you're facing today. One plus God is a majority. You got a little bit of oil. You got the Holy Spirit of God alive in your life. And so this woman says, well, maybe there is one small possibility. You see, remember, it doesn't take a lot of faith for a miracle. Jesus said you can have faith the size of a mustard seed, the smallest seed known in his day. And you can move a mountain. It's not the amount of your faith that's important. It's the object of your faith that's important. You can take the little bit of imperfect faith you have and place it all in a perfect, great God. And he will perform a miracle. It's not about having great faith. It's about having a great God. And faith is not denying the reality of the problem. Faith is just saying all things are possible with God. God's bigger than the problem. Faith is... Faith doesn't change the problem. Faith doesn't change the difficulty you're going through. It just gives you new eyes. You see through God's eyes and it gives you a whole new perspective. You see that God can take something small and make something great out of it. If you don't look through the eyes of faith, those small blessings will be too small for you to recognize and you will miss the miracle that God has for you. There are three dead ends that really stop a miracle in its tracks. The first is negative words. Many times we say, I have nothing in my house, and we miss the miracle. I heard about an elderly man who'd been deaf for years, and then a doctor came up with this experimental surgery and performed it on him, and it worked. He could hear, and six months later when he came back for his post-op appointment, the doctor said, well, how's your hearing? And he says, perfect. It's amazing. You know, I mean, my hearing is perfect. And the doctor said, I'm just curious, how's your family responded to you now that you can hear when you've been deaf all those years? And the man said, oh, I haven't told my family yet. I don't want them to know I can hear. I've changed my will four times in six months. (laughs) Be careful about negative words because God always hears. It's not about who hears down here on earth. God always hears. And it blocks God's blessings because it goes against faith. But then an accusing attitude can stop a miracle in its tracks when we blame others for our problems. God works miracles in the lives of those who take responsibility for the problem. Say, God, I got myself into this mess. I need you. And God, I'm in this situation. I need you. And then worried thoughts. If we prayed about our problems as much as we worry about them, we'd experience a lot more miracles and have a whole lot less to worry about. But then there's the fourth and most important sign this woman followed, the yield sign. I've got to yield to God and give what I have. So I stop and assess what I already have. Then I give to God what I have so he can multiply and work a miracle with it. In 2 Kings 4, 3, Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled, put it to one side. That was a really strange thing for the prophet to tell her to do. But it's the same thing God asks us to do when we need a miracle. And that's pour your life into empty vessels. This is just the opposite of our natural response when we're in a problem, we have a huge need. When we have a need, usually we say, I can't focus on anyone else. I can only focus on myself. I'm overwhelmed, so I can't lighten someone's load. But when you feel that way and you need a miracle, if you want God to work a miracle in your life, pour your life into empty vessels. Pour your life into others. He said, I want you to get all these empty vessels and pour what you have into those empty vessels. When you take the little bit that you have and you pour it into the lives of others, God works a miracle in your life. I've seen it all through my life. When I was a kid, some of you know my dad was a pastor. So I grew up as a PK, a perfect kid. And as I grew up, (laughs) a pastor's kid, and, and my dad would take my brother and sister and I every Christmas Eve to visit elderly widows in the church that couldn't get out. You know, they had nurses come to their house. They couldn't get out. And and so no one really came to visit them much during the year. And my dad and some people from church would. But on Christmas Eve, they didn't have any family around. We're stuck in the house. And we would go visit these elderly widows. And I have to admit, as a grade school kid, I hated that. 
because all I could think about was Santa's coming tonight, now I'm going to get all these great gifts, how awesome, and now I'm here in this boring place <laughs> with this old person. And that's really what I was thinking. But, you know, every Christmas Eve we would do that as a tradition because my dad knew that Christmas was all about pouring your life into others. And I have to say, I can barely remember any of the presents I got. I know they broke after two or three days. I remember creepy crawlers for some reason. I, I don't know, you know, and I can't remember hardly any of the gifts that I got. But I remember visiting those widows, and they would love to see kids. And they give us big hugs. And, and, you know, we would be there, and it, it would just be boring for me, but it meant so much to them. You pour your life into others. It makes all the difference in your life. When I got into college, I remember on Thursdays, I, I would go with some of my friends to the inner city, a church there that was ministering to teenagers, and we'd play ball with them and do a Bible study with them. And every Thursday, I'd always say, you guys go ahead. I've got a big test tomorrow, and, and there's no way that I can do it. I, I've, got a lot, I've got a paper to write. It, I'm just too busy. I can't really do that today. Maybe, maybe next week, you guys go ahead. And then i think, oh, brother, I need to go. And I would go, and those kids would minister to me get my eyes off myself, and God would begin filling me up. And then the next day I'd get a D on the test instead of an F, and God would work in my life a miracle, and it was, it was amazing. No, it wasn't quite like that, but pretty close. And somehow, I mean, God would multiply my time. Every time, it was like, wow, I got more done. God took care of it. But every Thursday I would feel the same way. Oh, I can't do it this Thursday. I got so much to do. It's a crazy week. This is nuts. I can't go minister to anyone else. This is a crazy week. I'm so stressed. And then I think, no. Nope. And I would go, and then my stress would just go away. I'd be filled with peace and joy. That's what you do. When you have a need, give away whatever it is you need. When you have a need, you have to give away whatever it is that you need. It's a paradox of life, but it's so powerful and important. Best advice I can give you when you need a miracle, start looking for empty vessels to pour your life into. And if you need a Christmas miracle, you've got a great opportunity. You've got some empty vessels that are all around you. And less than one week, we start our over 30 Christmas services. Saturday night, we start our Christmas services. And this year, it's called the Lights of Christmas. Our team's been working on it for so long, build an amazing thing. It's, it, this is going to be the most creative and powerful one ever. And I say that every year. And Chris always goes, you say that every year. And then afterwards she says, it really was. How would you know? And I go, I, I just see the guys working and all the things that they're doing, all the creativity. But God, God always does it, brings it together. And, and this presentation, you, you need to bring a friend. One of the most loving things you can do to pour yourself in the lives of others is bring them to a Christmas Eve service. And that's why we put in your program this little answer, you've got all kinds of stuff in your program today, but take this out and tear out. You've got three of these, okay? Three little cards. And I want you to think about three friends, neighbors or relatives right now that you can invite to one of our Christmas Eve services and bring them. And, and I guarantee you, this is going to be such a clear and creative presentation of the meaning of Christmas. And God's going to work in their life. And I, I, if you get them here, I believe that God can change them. And bring them to know him. And instead of just celebrating Christmas, they'll experience it maybe for the first time. I, I, and the reason people ask me all the time, Carrie, why don't you all ever just relax as a family and just experience Christmas as a family and not worry about all these services? And I go, I'd love to. A lot of churches do. They might have one service or no services at Christmas because the pastors are all hanging out with their families or traveling. And, but we say, this is our opportunity. There's so many people that will only come on Christmas Eve. And some churches say, if you only come at Christmas Eve, don't even bother. <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. You can't even get out of bed. You're a stench in the nostrils of God. We don't want to see you around here. You walk into our church on Christmas Eve, the church will fall in. We don't need you around here. If that's your only commitment is once a year, you once a year Christian. <laughs> you hypocrite. <laughs> and you know what we always say? We say, if you only come to church once a year, come to our church. Because yeah. maybe Jesus will get a hold of your heart and save you. And that's what's happened to, for a lot of you. Some of you came 15 years ago to a Christmas Eve service, and God got a hold of your heart, and you've never been the same. Some of you came last year, and you've never been the same. This is our chance. Every once in a while, someone that comes once a year will go, 
man, that pastor just preaches on Jesus being born in a manger. He's, got the, he's only got one sermon, I guess. Why should I come back? It's like, no, it's just it's Christmas. Come back the next week. I got more than one sermon. Give me a chance. But I really say bring a friend. And by the way, if you're not bringing a friend, don't come on Christmas Eve. No pastors will tell you that too. Don't come on Christmas Eve because last year at all our Christmas Eve services, we had over 1,500 people in the overflow watching on video on the, on the 24th. Come to one of the earlier services. Come next Saturday night, next Sunday morning. Um, there's going to be over 30 at our three campuses. Over 40,000 people will come through these doors. Many of them won't know the Lord. They celebrate Christmas, but they've never experienced it. And I would say too, that if you really want a Christmas miracle, pour your life into empty vessels by serving at a Christmas Eve service. Here's another insert in your program you ought to look at because we want every one of our 18,000 regular attenders each weekend to serve. We want every one of you to serve at one of the Christmas Eve services. Come and get fed and blessed and then stay and bless someone else. And here are all the different things that we need. We need every one of you to help serve. Uh, whether it's in the parking lot, greeting people, and if you just have the, the spiritual gift of smiling, you know, you ought to be out in the parking lot. And, uh, you know, no matter what, you know, we'd love for you, even if you're uh, a drug addict, go out in the parking lot. Well, no, maybe not that. But um, <laughs> no, it's fine in the parking lot. Just don't drive any of the trams, okay? So that, that'd be good. <laughs> really, I'm just saying, if you breathe, if you breathe, you know, be used of God. It, you know, I, you can be you can be Jesus to people, and you can serve in the children's ministry. You don't have to teach. We got all kinds of great teachers, and we'll train you what to do. We need every one of you. We'll train you. We'll teach you. All you have to do is sign up. Sign up for one of these things, and we'll use you, and God will bless you. Pour your life into others, and God meets your need. It's a paradox of life that we really rebel against, but that's the way God works in our lives. Well, let's move on. Pour your life in empty vessels and then give what I have in faith. See, this woman had the faith to pour out her last little bit of oil that she had left. Human wisdom says, if I have a need, I'm going to hold on to the little I have. I'm not going to give it away. God's wisdom says, whatever you need, you have to give it away. There was a time when the people of Israel were experiencing so many difficulties, one after the other, and they couldn't understand why they couldn't dig themselves out. And then God came to them in Malachi 3.8 and he spoke this. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. God said, you're robbing me. And they said, we're not. What do you mean, God, robbing you? We love you. You're number one in our lives. We sing praises to you. We worship you. We love you. He says, you're robbing me. And they said, we hate robbers. We hate thieves. We deal harshly with thieves. We hate it when people steal stuff from us. And God says, you are stealing from me because you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. And they knew what the tithe was. And the tithe was the command to give the first 10% of all we make back to God to show that he's first place in our lives. And they believed in tithing. They knew tithing was a powerful principle, but what happened was there's an economic downturn at the time. And, and I can just see in every family, they would say things like, you know what, the kids have a lot of expenses this month. It's very difficult. I know the tithe is giving God the first 10% of all we make. That's God's, but, but this month, we'll see what we have left at the end of the month. Maybe we'll have that at the end of the month. And instead of giving God the first, they gave leftovers. And they kept doing that over time until there wasn't anything left over. And God came to them and said, I know every dime you've stolen from me. I've got a record. You have ripped me off. You have stolen what is mine. And you're un your family's under a curse because of it. Your whole nation's under a curse because you keep stealing from me, taking from me right in front of my face what is mine. And God said, that's a serious thing. Hey, the great news, though, is God said, if you'll just start back obeying me and put me first in your finances, then I'll not... I'll not keep the curse on you. I'll lift the curse, but I'll also bless you. And I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour up blessings on you. You won't be able to contain because I love you. And I want you to experience my blessings. 
The children of Israel were in the stress zone. They couldn't figure out why. And God said, I want you to be in the blessed zone. I want you to underline the phrase, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse represents the local church. One of our great missions at Woodlands Church is our farmers' field schools, our agricultural ministry that we started in Maseno, Kenya many years ago. And we have many farmers' field schools now in Kenya, and we're moving now to start a, a lot of farmers' field schools in Haiti and all the other places we do missions because we found that it's so um, scalable and reproducible and impactful. It's really the key to a lot of things because in Africa, what we found is all these people would leave their land at five acres, 10 acres, because they said, our land's no good. Nothing will grow on this terrible red soil. And then the men would go into the cities, go into the slums to, to find work, and they wouldn't, and they would get AIDS, they'd come back and give it to their family. And it's just this vicious cycle would go on. And they thought their land was bad, but it was just they'd never been taught good agricultural principles. And they'd been ripped off by the seeds that they bought. And so we come in, and all these churches, we start farmers field schools and all these poor farmers come and we give them great seed grain that has been specifically designed for that kind of soil and it, and Texas A&M agricultural scientists are the ones who develop most of it so you know God work miracles anywhere and so anyway <laughs> no hissing please no hissing y'all are great y'all are great all you guys are awesome um, but but it's really cool to see and we have an agricultural scientist who's on um, basically the staff and what he does is uh, he teaches all of the teachers. And all these teachers at all these churches, we give them the grain the first year, all their grain, really good grain, all different types of vegetables. And then we teach them all these agricultural principles and they come every day and they learn and they learn God's word and many of them come to Christ and, and then they plant and they work really hard and their corn is like twice as high as their neighbor's corn. And, and the vegetables are just amazing. And then the neighbor says, how come you have such great crops? And they say, oh, it's because God you got to come to the church with me and you can be part of this farmer's field school. We learn biblical principles on, on farming and it's amazing. And so it just, it really just continues to, to reproduce. And then the first 10% of their harvest, the very first 10%, they have to get the harvest and get it all bagged up and bring it to the church. And they put it in the, in the churches. We have these rooms called the storehouses and they put it in the storehouses and that's given to the widows and the orphans. They have to tie the first 10% and they can't be part of our farmer's field schools. And they love doing that. And they love seeing the crops and then God bless them. By the third year, they don't need seed from us anymore. They're giving seed to others. It's amazing what God's doing. And it's just changing, you know, communities. And so we're going to expand that in a huge way into many different countries this year. But God's doing that through you. But I love the storehouse. I've walked in those storehouses in the churches and it's filled with all kinds of vegetables and food and grain. And, and it's like, that's the tithe. And, and that's what we're to do, give the first 10% back. And God says, then I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll meet your needs. And you'll be under a blessing in your life, no matter what's going on in life. The storehouse is the local church. It, it's good to give to charity. Chris and I give to charities. But the Red Cross is not the storehouse. That's the local church. There are a lot of great Christian ministries. You ought to give to them. But Christian ministries aren't the storehouse. That's the local church. You give your tithe to the local church for God's glory and for your blessing. That's what the scripture tells us. we got a great chance to do that. If you're a first-time guest, then you can just tune me out for the next couple of minutes. This is something our church has been looking forward to and praying about for quite some time that we do every year our Christmas offering. And this year we're calling it Rise. And I want everyone to take out of your program that Rise card and the envelope. We've talked about it a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it much. But in a few minutes we're going to give our Christmas offering over and above our regular tithes and offerings. Um, and it's such a powerful offering, a sacrificial offering, because... 15 years ago, Chris and I noticed that everybody gets presents but the birthday boy, Jesus Christ. And she said, Carrie and our family, we want to give our greatest gift to Christ at Christmas. And our kids see us, you know, give that gift and, and that he's the one that gets the most and it's about him. Our children in the children's ministry are giving their offerings. They've been collecting in their little banks change. They've been shaking you down for change for the last month and they're giving it because we want them to know Christmas is about Jesus. I love everything about the Christmas traditions Santa Claus and Frosty and Rudolph and all that. But I want you to know Christmas is not about Santa Claus, Frosty and Rudolph. It's about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is 
Christmas. And he is the birthday boy. We honor him and we praise him, we lift him up, and we give to him. And so in this Rise offering, what we're asking you to do, and this goes to some initiatives above and beyond, and we're asking everyone to give a one-time gift. Um, you can give it today if you haven't given it yet, and just today's the big day that most of us will be giving ours. And just it says cash gift, and just write out what you're giving and write out the check. This one-time gift. And if you want to give electronically, you can, or through a push pay, you can, but still write out what you're giving in your one-time gift. And then it says a one-year commitment. Write out what you are praying for God to do in your life. Ask God to show you, to give you a faith number. And say, God, I can't give that now, but I'm praying you'll do that so that I can. And, and step out in faith. Give in faith. And, and write it. Maybe if you never tithe, you ought to just write down tithe. This offering is above and beyond our regular tithes, but... But if you've never started tithing, just write out, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to start tithing and making an impact. And we can't all give the same amount, but we can all sacrifice. Some of you, $10 would be a huge sacrifice because you're going through a really tough financial time. And others would be, you know, over 100000 for it to be a sacrifice. I don't know where you're at. It doesn't matter. God knows. You do what God tells you to do. And there's a very important reason we do this, two very important reasons. First, because God blesses when we focus on him. Get our eyes off ourselves. Give him what we have. He multiplies it. You cannot give God. Secondly, there's a practical reason for our church because our church, like all churches and most nonprofit ministries, up to 30% of our ministry and missions budget comes in during this time, and it determines everything we can do the next year as we stretch and, and believe God to reach more and more people and to meet more needs of hurting people. And so I really encourage it. Let's pray about it. Do what God tells you to do in faith. And believe God for great things in your life. And put Jesus first at Christmas. Well, let's look at this last part of it because I give what I have in faith and then I expect God to multiply it. 2 Kings 4, 6, it says, when the containers were all full, she said to her son, bring me another container. And he said to her, there's not one left. Then the oil stopped multiplying. So she collects all these empty vessels and after she finishes pouring oil in the last one, the miracle stops. It stops multiplying. And I'm sure she probably thought, wow, why didn't I get twice as many? But then what would I do? What would you do? Would we say, well, this is kind of crazy, so I'm just going to kind of test this a little bit. I'm just going to get one container and then pour into it and see if God works a miracle. Then I'll go back and get more. If she would have done that, that's all she would have had is one filled container. But God worked the miracle according to what she believed. And somehow God works miracles according to our faith. Jesus said, be it done to you according to your faith. It's all God's miracle, but somehow he allows my expectations to come together with his miracle working power. And God says, expect a miracle in the next few days. Expect a miracle in the next few weeks. Expect me to do a miracle in your life. Your faith, even small and imperfect, will come together with my miracle working power and collide with it and the miracle will happen. So she gives what she has to God and God multiplies it. That's the story of Woodland Church. Every step of the way, God has multiplied it. Multiplied it. When we started and 15 people gathered in a home 22 years ago and I was so fired up and preached this great message and then only eight came back, I was so discouraged. But God said, Carrie, what do you have in your house? And it's like, it's eight people and... You know, five of them are my family and three of, them are, three of them are really weird. You know, I mean, I don't want them to come back, God. One's in all camo, you know. But God said, what do you have in your house? I was like, well, we're kind of a motley crew. Well, I don't, nothing there at all except a little bit of oil. And God said, okay, I can, I can do miracles with that. Surrendered all to me. And that allowed me and allowed Chris to surrender it all to him. You know, when we realized it'd have to be him. And that's the way it is every step of the way at our church. And when we pour into empty vessels, God multiplies it. Oscar grew up in the slums, the quarry slum outside of Nairobi, Kenya. And when he was in grade school, he got hooked on drugs and alcohol. He became violent, got kicked out of school. And when he was in high, when he was in high school years... His parents kicked him out of the house because they couldn't deal with him anymore. And at that point, 
he realized how desperate he was. He had no food. He was going to starve to death. And he walked into a little stone church in the quarry slum. No one was there, but he just looked up and he said, God, save me. I give up, Jesus. Somehow save me. And everything began to change. Then he met some kids in the youth group, in this youth group in the quarry slum. They began to disciple him and grow in him. And, and he began to grow in the Lord. And God began to work in his life. And his parents took him back. And, and God began to bring him back to the same school he was kicked out of. And the principal couldn't believe the change. And the teachers couldn't. And when we met Oscar, he was going to like 15 schools in the slums playing ball with them, and he would speak to all the kids about what God could do in your life and how there's a purpose and how God has a plan. And you need to stay in school. And he went back to school, got his education. He could have long left the quarry slum when we met him. And several years ago, as we feel like Oscar is one of our kids. He always calls Chris Mama Chris. And uh, she says that he's our fifth child. And we love him, you know, like a child, uh, like one of our kids. He's an amazing man. And several years ago, we just kind of put in his heart, what if God calls you to start a church? What if, and, and he's our full-time pastor. You pay him. He's your full-time pastor to minister at Wilderness Church Nairobi along with the other staff members that you support. And because of that, the church is growing exponentially. Explosive growth is happening because Oscar's ministering to kids in all those schools. They're coming to church and their lives are being changed because we poured into this one man. And he's so passionate. Whenever we're over there on a mission trip, he'll usually room with one of our boys. And a lot of times it's Josh. And at 5 a.m., Oscar's up. Josh, Josh, we need to get up. And Josh's like, why? He goes, because we got to go out and tell people about Jesus. We got we got work to do. And he's like, Oscar, can't we just sleep a little longer? And he goes, Josh, you can sleep when you get to heaven. I'm going to sleep for the first 10,000 years. He says, literally, first 10,000 years in heaven, I'm just going to sleep. <laughs> then I'll wake up and eternity will have just begun. But he said, I don't have time to sleep down here. And that's what he does every day. He's out there in the slum. He could have left the quarry slum years ago. He's a brilliant young man. But he feels called. And you believed in him enough to pour into him. And now thousands are being touched. God's working in thousands. And that's the way it is in every one of our missions, every one of our ministries. When you get your eyes off yourself, you pour your life into someone else, you're the one who is blessed. Let's bow together. Lord, I pray for everyone here who needs a miracle. You know who they are and you know the need. And I pray that you would meet them at their point of need. I pray that you would just help them see the signs that are in front of them that they need to, to follow. Help them realize the miracle is right under their nose. It seems small and insignificant, but that's how you start the miracle. And help us all to surrender the little we have to you so that you can work the miracle in our lives. Meet people at the point of their need, Lord, but don't leave us there. Bring us to where you want us to be. And then, Lord, I pray for those who have never received you into their life, that they right now would just say, Jesus Christ, you are the Christ of Christmas. I need you to forgive me of all my sins. Like Oscar, I admit I need the greatest miracle of all. I need you to change my life. Forgive me of my sins and take me to heaven one day. And then, Lord, I, I pray that as we get ready to give this offering, we dedicate it all to you. We ask you to multiply it. We ask you, Lord, to strengthen every one of us to not let fear keep us from the miracle, but experience, Lord Jesus. Give us the faith to step into the miracle. And then, Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone who gives with your blessings because we can't outgive you. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring the miracles that we need at just the right time. Bless our giving and bless all of our ministries and missions as we stretch to reach people for you, knowing that the church is the hope of the world. Because, Lord, we're your body. We're your hands. We're your feet. We're your voice as you fill us up and we follow your call. Then we can walk to the hurting and the hopeless and we can reach out to the hurting and hopeless and we can share your hope through our voice and our works. Lord, let us be the church, the light. We live in a dark world, Lord, but you are the light of the world and you can roll back the darkness. Do that for your glory. Bless our giving in Jesus' name, amen.